Let's see if this works. The uh, other section. Oh, okay. it's okay. But just just now coming out. I guess I thought I knew how to do this, but apparently I don't. So. Uh, it's like, trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> like my presentation is not popping up, but my like background on my computer is. So like, All right, Andy, I'm sitting down. Yeah. Got it. Uh, you just try unplugging and plugging back in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like the go-to. Um, hmm. Sometimes it's All right. like you have a lawful lot open, girl. I know. You don't have a whole lot of battery either. Um, did you try like the mirror image thing? No. Hi, Anna. Oh, is she? Are you the technical help? No, nope. no, oh. she's just my assistant. What do you want me to do? Is there anything you want me to do at all? Um, I think right now we're just trying to get the thing out. Um, I think Mac is more than mine, but um, oh yeah, Cody's gonna be way more than oh, Cody. I. Cody, <laughs> just here to help. Um, just so you know, we are live streaming this this session. Uh, not a big deal. There will probably be minimal viewership online, but uh, yeah, totally easy. Uh, the mics are the things with blue on them. If for some reason they go, red, and so it ought to be blue. Unless you needed to like not tell somebody something online. Okay. What are we trying to do? Um, well, the background of my computer is showing, but the presentation itself isn't showing. Like, oh, well, sure. Well, let's do. Do you want both of the same thing on both screens, or do you want two separate screens where one shows the slides and one shows like, notes or something? Uh, no, just like this whole. Okay. You, you want the view option? Yeah. Okay. So. Oh, yeah, sorry. My step is right Don't do that. <laughs> so, we're going to mirror the display. So, whatever's happening on one is happening on the other. And then up here, you'll see that there's a present at the top of this window. Uh -huh. And so, on slides, it'll sort of swing it around to full size. Also, I would recommend that we adjust the lights slightly. I always forget which one it is. So, for those of you who don't like lights changing, apologies. The lights are. Have you ever tried this? Wake up. Wake up. And if you go the whole time mm -hmm. and I race out of here right when it ends, it's because I'm in a panel following. Oh, the plastic one? Okay. So don't don't like to take that as like, why didn't the light end before? Is that an automatic edit? Okay. Or okay. Um, and it should be ready, but just do the edit and double check. Yeah, I think, well, so um, I was going to start it off with kind of like having a quick little discussion, like asking like, what are the factors that make people sick? And then also, um, what are the stereotypes that people hear about those in poverty? That's then, good to yeah. ask what they hear because they're not going to, if you ask what they have, they're not going to, what stereotypes do you have? They won't tell you. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll go ahead and mute it online for the moment oh. while the sidebar <laughs> is happening just in case. This is going to be an awesome session. <laughs> I like it. Um, all right. Just look at me every once in a while, and I'll be like, we're slow down. Got it. 
big for us. I'll swing in from time to time. I probably will dash in now. So if there's something that goes haywire, I'll be back soon. Okay. Thanks, Cody. Just I won't know how to. Uh, we can just walk out with our certificates now. <laughs> All right, yeah. I'm gonna take my seat. I give people a few minutes just to that. Do you want me to introduce you? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to. No, I don't really have an introduction. Yeah. I was just going to kind of wing it. You can do great. Fancy. I know. Okay, hear my name. <laughs> what year are you? Uh, I'm a junior. I'm a super senior, but I won't say that, so I'll just say junior. Okay. Okay, another couple of seconds. Don't, if people come in, don't worry about it. If okay. they leave, don't worry about it. Okay. Okay. All right, if I could have everyone's attention. Thank you all for coming uh, to the third annual Power and Privilege Symposium at University of Alaska Southeast. I am pleased to introduce the first presenter in this breakout session. Um, this is India Busby. She's an upper level uh, student at UAS. Um, my name is Laura Vess. I'm an assistant professor of sociology. India is in my medical sociology class right now, and one of their options for their final project was to do a power and privilege symposium presentation. And so India was really bold and decided to do one. She did a, a good uh, presentation last year on Islamophobia as well. So India's title is Poverty and Health, Deconstructing the Physical and Mental Impacts on Impoverished Families in the US. So thank you, India. Um, so yeah, hi, hello. Um, so I, before I start my lecture, I actually kind of wanted to start off with a couple discussion questions. Um, so you guys can either talk amongst yourselves or you guys can talk to your neighbor either way. Um, so the first question that I kind of want to ask is, um, so what do you guys think what make people sick? Like it could be a living environment, it could be their job, um, it could be racism. So those are a couple of factors that could make people um, sick. But yeah, so if you guys kind of wanted to take a couple minutes and talk to yourselves or not to yourself, I mean, you could, <laughs> but <laughs> or you could talk to your partner. Um, yeah, and then I'll come back to you guys in a minute or two. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, okay, so is anybody willing to kind of share some of the ideas that they came up with? I'll pick on people. <laughs> uh, well, we talked about, um, like you said, living environment can affect that, but also um, like stress levels mm -hmm. will factor into it and like your diet. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Mindy? Yeah, we talked about um, food and stress also in like the changing of seasons and when it gets cold and it's hot, hot and Mm -hmm. Eric? We talked about water and air quality and other environmental factors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Does anybody else want to share a little bit? All right, <laughs> uh, time to move on to the second question that I have, and don't worry, it's the final one. Um, so what are some of the stereotypes that you guys have heard about people in poverty? Um, it could be something like, oh, they're lazy, they're just taking money from the government, um, anything kind of like that. So I'll give you guys another couple minutes to talk amongst yourselves or talk to your partner about that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now that I've given you guys a couple minutes to talk about um, what are the stereotypes that you guys had, did anybody want to share what they've heard about people in poverty? Lazy. Thank you. <laughs> Josh? Uh, they often have drug addictions or uh, alcohol addictions. Mm -hmm. well, Sophie? Two different types. There's people who actually are in poverty and are struggling. Mm -hmm. They're trying, but then there's the people that we all associate with. They're like, oh, they're trying, but they're just, they don't try to do anything with their lives. They're just having kids just to get more money. Yeah. Um, so actually going off on that. Um, so that is kind of like a big stereotype that people have that about people in poverty, that they just keep having babies to get more money from the state, um, which isn't entirely true. Um, some states actually don't even give people in poverty extra money for having a kid um, or having multiple kids. Um, some of them maybe give them like a small amount, like $83 per kid. Um, that's the that's the amount that they have in Pennsylvania, at least. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much Alaska has um, or how much they pay, but yeah, so that's actually a really good one, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, does anybody else have one that they want to share that they heard? That they're unintelligent. Oh, yeah, that's a good one, too. And that uh, the reason they're in poverty is because they're, they, they're just choosing to not get out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so now that we've kind of had those small little discussion questions, um, I am going to get started on my lecture. Um, so what is poverty? So a lot of you guys already know what this is. It's a state of being extremely poor. Um, I do want to clarify that poverty is not 
the same as low income. Um, so, um, so low income is 200% above the federal, the federal poverty level. Um, so for example, a family of four who had an income of 24,600 or less would be considered in poverty. So that's how much they would be making yearly. Um, and then a family of four that was making 48,000 um, would be considered low income. Um, so there's kind of a bit of a difference. So I kind of want to make that clear before we continue. Um, so there's six different types of poverty. Um, so there's situational. Um, so this is the type of poverty that's, temp that's usually temporary. Um, it could be, um, it usually involves like a crisis or some type of loss. Um, the most common one is environmental disasters. So a good example of this would be um, Puerto Rico, after Hurricane Maria, a lot of the people in Puerto Rico are very much in poverty because a lot of their homes were destroyed um, because of that. So um, as of right now, that would be considered situational. Um, the next would be generational poverty. Um, so this includes, like, involves the birth of two generations that are into poverty. Um, so because they were born into that situation of being poor, they usually don't have the tools or the support to get out of that cycle. Um, so that's something to kind of keep in mind as well. Um, absolute poverty is pretty much homelessness. Um, they are, they don't really have the basic necessities. Um, they don't have a roof over their head, don't have food, they don't have water. Um, so that's, yeah, so that's absolute poverty. Um, relative poverty is, it's like the average standard of that person's society. Um, so what could be considered a high income in one country could be considered middle or low income in another. Um, Next would be urban poverty. So this is only for metropolitan areas with populations over 50,000 people. Um, so there's overcrowding, there's violence, noise, and poor community health programs that make it even more difficult for people who are suffering um, for this type of pop, like to get out of poverty. Um, and then rural poverty is the opposite of urban. Um, so these areas are non-metropolitan with populations below 50,000 people. Um, they also have limited services available for people who are struggling and probably don't have a good amount of job opportunities. Um, so that makes it even harder for them to get out of the cycle of poverty. Does anybody have any questions so far? Rad, okay. So um, this is, um, for 2017, this is the federal poverty level guidelines for the lower 48. I also have one for Alaska that I'll be showing in a bit. Um, so as you can see, um, the, so for one person in the household, they need to be at least making twelve thousand sixty um, or less yearly in order to be in the federal poverty level. Um, so yeah, for the family of four, it'd be twenty four thousand six hundred. Um, so Medicaid eligibility. Uh, so this one was a little bit tricky, um, but it's basically. Um, so, yeah, looking at that, um, for children, it was extended to at least 138% of the federal poverty level in every state. Um, some states will cover children at a higher um, at a higher income level, but so the states that were given option to extend eligibility to adults with income at or below 138% of federal poverty level. Um, and then for premium subsidy threshold, um, so that is um, individuals whose household income falls between 100 and 400 percent of the federal poverty line, and they could be eligible for a premium tax subsidy that can lower the health insurance cost. Um, that was a lot of information and super sorry, but does anybody have any questions about this one? Rad. So um, this one is for Alaska. So as you can see, our federal poverty level is a little bit higher than the lower 48. Um, so I'll take you, I'll let you guys take a couple of minutes to, or a couple of seconds, I guess, to look at this one. Um, so for more of a visual aspect, so this uh, map over here shows the poverty in the United States and the, the percentage of people in poverty by state. Um, so as you can see, New Mexico um, has, New Mexico, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Washington, D.C. have 18% or more um, people in poverty. And then 
Um, this graph from the National Center for Children in Poverty shows race and ethnicity among children by family income in the United States in 2016. Um, so for low income, 35% is white. For people at federal poverty level, 31% uh, are white, um, 24 are black and poor, uh, 20 in low income for black people. Um, so yeah. And then, so how does poverty affect parenting? Um, so parents who are in poverty are more than likely to face a larger range of issues than affluent parents, um, such as depression, low levels of education, domestic violence, mental and physical health, and um, a few more. But they also have insu insufficient surveillance over the children. So they probably are paying much attention to their kids because they have other issues going on or they're just trying to find a job or they're working a lot that they're not able to be home. Um, so they're not able to pay attention much to their kids. Um, so lack of control over a child's behavior. Um, if they can't control the child's behavior, um, then they kind of go for harsh discipline um, because they just probably don't know exactly like how to discipline their kids since they have other issues going on. Um, so that could be like spanking, slapping, hitting, or some type of verbal abuse. Um, there's also lower parental warmth, meaning that the children aren't receiving as much support and care from their parents. Um, so families in poverty are less likely to live in a good neighborhood. Um, they're less likely to be involved with sports and or music, um, probably because their school doesn't have the funding to have the kids be able to play with sports or be able to have a good music program. Um, so, and they're also not as likely to go on vacation. So that's also something that a lot of kids in poverty don't get to be able to do. Um, so yeah, so what happens to children in poverty? Um, so in 2016, 41% of children lived in low income families in the United States. Um, so near poor is, um, so poor is basically like poverty, near poor is the low income. So those guys are added up together. Um, and then 59% of children lived above low income. Um, so children are, um, children who are in low income or below the poverty line will either have physical or mental health issues. Um, there's also a risk of involvement with child welfare and juvenile justice agencies. Um, and children will most likely also have to a toxic stress response. Um, so kind of going into toxic stress. Um, so what exactly is it? Um, so toxic stress response occurs when a child experiences um, frequent adversities such as physical or emotional abuse, uh, chronic neglect, one or both parents suffer from substance abuse or mental illness, um, the children have exposure to violence, the children feel the burden of family economic hardship, and there's a lot of lack of adult and family support. Um, so these toxic stress responses um, are very much um, adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have probably heard this term. Um, so this, uh, so adverse childhood experiences was, it was originally a study um, that was conducted in 1995 by Centers for Disease Control um, in Kaiser Permanent Healthcare Organization. Um, so there's three different kinds of adversity, which are physical and emotional abuse, neglect, um, and household dysfunction. Um, so adverse childhood experiences are really common, um, even among people who are in middle class population. Um, a lot of people don't think so, but you really never know. Um, so these experiences will trigger an excessive and long lasting stress response, um, which can have a really big wear and tear effect on the body, especially in children. Um, so ACEs can cause poor outcomes later in life, including heart disease, diabetes, obesity, depression, substance abuse, and a lot more. Um, people with four or more ACEs are seven times as likely to be alcoholics as people with no ACEs. Um, some, yeah, so that's kind of a big statistic that I found in an article um, that I read. And so I think that was kind of alarming, especially because people in poverty are more than likely to have six or more um, ACEs. So um, I'm going to read a couple questions that are kind of in the ACE test, if you guys haven't taken it yourselves. Um, so I have two. Um, so one question is, 
Before your 18th birthday, birthday, did a parent or another adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt? Um, so that's one question that people have to answer. And then before your 18th birthday, did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were more important or special or your family didn't look out for each other or feel close to each other to support each other? Um, there's a few more questions that involved sexual assault that happened in the household. Um, a lot more about having to see your parents involved in violence or substance abuse, um, if the kids have actually seen that happen with their parents. Um, and there's a few more questions there too. Um, so yeah, if you haven't taken the, the ACEs test, highly recommend it um, just to be kind of curious about what your score is. Um, so now I'm gonna kind of talk about the physical impact of poverty. Um, so, um, so people who live in poverty have a 50% higher risk of developing heart disease. Um, so the pressure of people who live in poverty or the people, the pressure of being poor um, can cause the body to pump out a lot more stress hormones. Even after people who um, try to exit out of poverty, um, they still feel that stress um, from being in poverty, especially even when they're older and they're making a lot, probably a lot more than what they had when they were a kid. Um, and then they also have high blood pressure. Um, there's long-term anxiety and mood control issues. Um, so even though they're probably out of poverty, they're still thinking and still having anxiety about where their next meal is coming from, how much money they have to save, um, what, they, what do they have to do in order to not go back to where they were. Um, so a lot of people actually have a lot of anxiety about that issue. Um, a lot of them can also get asthma too. So the reason for the asthma is probably because of their living environment. They're probably living in a pretty crappy area. Um, so they're probably not able to get, you know, kind of like what Eric Scott said about, you know, air rates and stuff like that. So they probably don't have good air quality. Um, and they also live in poor homes that can be hazardous. Um, so a lot of homes that are um, located in low income areas, um, they're still lead involved in those homes. And so they're being exposed to lead. Um, so yeah, and then um, so young girls who are repeatedly exposed to poverty growing up are more likely to be overweight or obese. Um, and then with men, it, they actually tend to be a lot more lean because they go for jobs that are mostly manual labor. Um, so they're, um, there's not that much data about men in poverty who are overweight as much as there is about um, girls who are overweight in poverty. Um, so yeah, and last but not least, uh, premature death. Uh, yeah. And then, so how is obesity linked to poverty? Um, so people who live in poor communities have terrible access to fresh food and produce. Uh, so food deserts are also an issue when it comes to accessing fresh food. Um, I'll also be kind of going in depth about that and then showing you guys a map of the food deserts that are in the United States. Um, the one for Alaska didn't load, so I couldn't take a screenshot of it, but so I only have the one for the lower 48. Um, but yeah, so uh, food deserts are described as geographic areas um, where residents' access to affordable, healthy food options are either restricted or they're non-existent due to not having a grocery store within a traveling distance. Um, so people in poverty probably don't have cars. Um, they probably, you know, have to walk to a grocery store, which if it's further away, they're not going to. So they're going to go to places that are more convenient, like convenience stores, which don't have fresh produce, or they're gonna be going to fast food options um, because that's the closest that they have. So, and it's also cheaper. Um, so they're probably gonna go for something that's a lot more cheaper than paying a crap ton of money that they don't have for food that they can't get. So yeah, and then there's the grocery and transportation gap um, that kind of goes into the food deserts. Um, because of our economy, grocery stores aren't necessarily in big in like big cities anymore. They're a little further away. Um, and so because of that, um, people in urban areas do have access to transportation like buses and stuff. But a lot of the times they have to take multiple bus trips in order to go to the store. Good example is like here in Juneau. Um, our bus stop is at Fred Meyer, but you have to stop at a whole bunch of different or you have to transfer 
to another bus in order to get to the store. And even then you can't get as much as you would like because you can only carry so much. Um, so that's one thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, they also have less physical activity. Um, so kind of going into that, like I said, with the schools, the school probably doesn't have a lot of funding in order to keep the physical education classes that they have. So the kids aren't getting as much exercise as they need. Um, they also probably live in an area that don't have parks or there's so much violence that they're not going to risk going and playing outside. Um, they also probably just don't have, they don't have access to bicycles because they could either get stolen um, or they're broken and they can't afford to fix it or they just can't afford to get one. Um, so that kind of goes into the um, physical activity. Um, so fast food chains have also increased their presence in poor rural communities. Um, so not only that, but these fast food restaurants also offer a super size meal, um, which I'm sure you guys have probably heard. But yeah, um, because of those super size foods, food, it's uh, it's cheaper. It's a cheaper option than fresh food. So of course they're going to kind of go for what they can afford. Um, and so here's the slide that I was talking about that involves um, the food deserts in America. So um yeah it's the green areas are kind of like the bigger areas of the food deserts and where stores aren't located so it's kind of messy and a little blurry so i apologize for that but yeah um so here are some of the mental impacts of poverty um so 22 percent of children in the united states have higher rates of child disruptive behavior um disorders which is also known as dpd um and then children and families have concerning levels of depressive symptoms. Um, and teenagers between 13 and 17 will have long-term anxiety, depression, and externalizing behaviors. Um, children who are also at risk for optional or oppositional defiant disorder. Um, so all these mental health issues prevent children from being able to break out of the cycle of poverty. Um, their mental health could be pretty bad, so it's making them harder to get either better, better grades at school, um, having the motivation to make their lives better because they have that lack of parental warmth um, or support that they have. And then, I mean, of course, like not all children in poverty feel that way, but most of them do. Um, so here are kind of some of the solutions that um, I've either read in articles um, or I've just kind of have seen for myself. Um, so there's an article that I read that um, had explained that Boston Medical Center. Um, so for the patients that they have in poverty, they actually prescribe them um, bicycle memberships for $5 instead of the $85 that it's originally costed at. Um, but a lot of the time it's because they don't get the good exercise that they need. Um, so usually the doctors will ask them, um, like, do you have a bike? And if they say no, then they usually just prescribe them a bicycle, like a year long membership for a bike hub that they have in Boston. So they can use that whenever. Um, so I think that would be pretty great if most places could do that. Um, and then another thing is raising minimum wage. Um, so we're kind of already a little bit doing this. Um, in the United States, but it's not as much as it could be. Um, so a lot of people who do work in minimum wage jobs, they just don't have enough money to afford to take care of their family. Um, and a lot of people who do work in those jobs have like either one or two kids or they're a single parent. Um, so it's important to kind of keep that in mind as well. Um, kind of have more, so to have more accessible fresh produce in poor communities. Um, and like I mentioned before, um, a lot of poor communities don't have access to fresh produce. And that also goes with the transportation gap, that goes with the grocery gap, that just is because it's too expensive. Or there's some stores that actually do exist in poor communities and they don't get the best quality produce. It's probably already rotting. It's probably already pretty gross. Um, so of course they're not gonna go for that and they're gonna go for something that seems a little bit more appetizing or that isn't rotten. Um, also to have access, um, to have more accessible food banks. Um, some food banks, a lot of the transportation just can be a pain to get there. Um, there's a food bank here in Juneau um, that's located by the sandbar. Um, so it's a little further away from the bus station. So people can't get as much food as they would like from the food bank because that's probably as much as they can carry. Um, so it's a great place. If you haven't gone to the food bank, um, it's fantastic. Darren's a great guy. Um, so highly recommend that if you 
also don't have access to food. Um, and then there's groups such as Health Leads. Um, so Health Leads is a national healthcare organization that connects low income or people in poverty um, with the basic resources that they need to be healthy. Um, so they kind of give them like advice on how to eat properly. They actually give them fresh food. Um, they give them kind of like economic help in order to kind of make their home a better place and not as terrible. Um, some places probably have like roach infestations. They can't really do a lot about that, but they can kind of help you get towards the way of fixing that problem. Um, so yeah. Do you guys have any other solutions that would be beneficial towards those in poverty? Yeah. Colleen. So um, I really appreciate your presentation and you taking the time to share what you've learned so far. Mm -hmm. Um, poverty is an outcome of a lot of things. And um, one of the things that I was thinking of, especially when we think about our campus and the students that we serve, um, when I think about uh, the kind of training that faculty and staff and our administration uh, receive, one of the things that's optional, but shouldn't be optional, is um, trauma-informed training. That should be a mandatory training for all of our faculty, staff, and our leaders. Mm -hmm. um, we should also have culturally relevant training. Um, we've kind of touched the surface by offering safe zone training where we're exposed to just the surface of the LGBTQ plus mm -hmm. um, community and I think that needs to be expanded. I think we need to work closely with our, our community to bring in um, some thought leaders to help, um, help our faculty and staff understand that just because a student is sitting in the class doesn't mean that they have all the tools that they need, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because what, what ends up happening is if we assume that every student who's sitting here came equipped with the same access to resources, um, then, then we do a disservice to ourselves because we know there's lots of students who, like you said, need access to mental health services, need access to tutoring, need access. But, and, and that's really great to put that out there for our folks, but I think the, um, the heavy lifting really needs to happen on our leaders, on our faculty and our staff for us to do, um, be better trained and well-rounded to understand the service or the students that are coming onto our campus. Um, it's not enough to want to be a student at UAS. Um, and it's also not enough for our faculty and staff to say, oh, welcome to my class. Um, we should really have a better understanding of who we're serving mm -hmm. in our classrooms. And so um, I would just add to that putting more of the weight on our decision makers who are our administrators, our faculty, and our staff to be better equipped to support the success of students who are interested in coming to our campus. So anyway, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Jeffrey, did you have something? Just real quick, on any given uh, election cycle, and today's the actual yeah. voting day, always, I think it's really important that we're mindful of candidates are looking at to see if they're in support of public education, which I think is the great equalizer if there is, if there is such a thing. And, and just make sure that both at the state, local, national level, we, we look to candidates who are in support of public education. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, did any of you guys have like any questions about anything or is there anything you kind of want to discuss? Yeah. Well, actually it's more like a comment that uh, one of the solutions is a spiritual solution to poverty, and sometimes we, we forget, though, that the churches are looking at uh, their own perspective and their own congregation, but also doing outreach, um, providing many food banks and, and meals for individuals um, throughout the week. So I think there's a, <coughs> there is another aspect of is it really addressed uh, in any of your bullets there? Yeah. And that would be, you know, and coordinating and, and, and maybe even bringing to light more uh, some of the uh, 
church, uh, churches in the community that are providing services that uh, help people who are have needs. Yeah, and I'm very glad that you mentioned that. that, mentioned that. Um, so yeah, I'm very sorry that I forgot to add that to my presentation. Um, but thank you so much for speaking up about that. Yeah, Laura. Uh, thank you all again for coming. I was just coming back on a couple of things that were said to make sure it's really clear is that educational attainment is a really primary way that people can improve their income. So when the comments were mentioned about making higher education more accessible in terms of addressing inequalities perhaps in the classroom and making people have access, um, for those of you who are students, like you are doing yourself a big service by being at UAS um, or any university that you choose to go to because that does help get people either to stay in their existing income bracket or to move up an income bracket. Um, and I would piggyback on what Colleen said, if you're a student who like, doesn't feel that your needs are being met in the classroom, you know, um, talk to folks, find the folks who will listen to you on that front. Because while India's presentation was primarily about uh, poverty and health, um, as a sociologist, there's no real way to, to sort of disconnect all of those for the other demographic positions that we hold. So I just want to plug those comments and reinforce what India has been saying on that front. Hi, Anna. Um, I just wanted to ask what sort of solutions you can give for, like, on the individual level, like what we can do here as individuals to help at all. Um, I think, like, as an individual, I think maybe, like, if you have, like, canned food at home that you don't want, you can donate it to a food bank. There's also, I kind of want to put a plug in this, too. There's also kind of, like, a small little food bank at the Student Resource Center, um, so you guys can just go and talk to the front desk and let them know that that's what you need or talk to an advisor that's down there or anybody that's down there um, and let them know kind of the situation. They'll be more than happy to let you have some food. Um, so if there's like food that you guys don't want um, or don't need or you're probably not ever going to eat, um, definitely like donate it to the SRC. Um, I've definitely done that a couple times. So because I hate goldfish, but I donated it. <laughs> you know, somebody likes goldfish, but yeah, so that's kind of one thing that you can do at an individual level. Um, can, I, can I add one more too? <laughs> Sorry. Um, if you are a student who like has a financial barrier and you have lots, you haven't um, been sort of kicked out of your class for the term because of the gap in pay, come to your professors. Because when it happens for students in my class, I tell them, like, keep coming to class until you get this figured out. Um, because you may be dropped from the roles, but the professor will keep teaching you and they will keep giving you assignments to grade. So if you're planning on figuring that out, talk to them. Don't just say like, oh, I got kids out of my class because I couldn't afford it. If you're planning and able to get back enrolled, I don't know if that's what you're supposed to do. I don't know if I'm violating the bureaucracy of UAS. But, um, but most of us, I think, will keep you in the class and um, want you to still be enrolled. And Laura, you can totally do that. Okay. <laughs> um, and just one last uh, kind of back to voting. I think it's really powerful again, surrounding platforms and keeping education accessible. And also, as students, you know, um, I find UAS is pretty quiet. Use your voice, lobby. When I'm talking about tuition increases, fee increases, really listen to that information and know that you know you have the power to say something and to stand up for keeping education accessible and equitable. So um, yeah, and work with your student government or whoever you feel is a, a good, effective partner for you. So. Yeah, does anybody have any other questions or anything that they kind of want to make a comment? Oh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. You were asking what you can do as an individual. And if you have the resources to act as an individual, um, it's great to do things like donate to the food bank um, it's also great to work towards systemic change. Um, so when you donate food, you're helping one family once, in one situation. But if we can act towards systemic change as a group, um, we can hopefully change underlying factors that go in. And so that can look like a lot of different ways depending on your resources and your time and your energy and your ability to have a commitment. So you can join groups, you can advocate, you can vote, you can run for public office, um, join nonprofits, things like that. 
Uh, oh, wow. Okay. Um, Deb, guy in the blue jacket, and then... <laughs> Another thing that I think students can do here, uh, kind of piggybacking off of the faith-based uh, opportunities, there's a network of churches that are part of um, a group called Family Promise. And what they're doing is they're opening up those church buildings to house families that might be homeless, that might be experiencing some difficult times. And over here, Chapel by the Lake, they are one of the churches that are doing that. And so you can just head over there they're looking for, you know, tutors for the kids. Um, they house them overnight. So there's people that stay there overnight, the adults. But there could be some opportunities for students to be more engaged with people who are kind of going through that. And so uh, feel free to contact Chapel by the Lake since it's within walking distance. Yeah. And then did you have something to say too? I was just wondering, I think there's something across bicycles, bicycle programs and whatnot, and different research and news articles. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything more you can say about that? If you came across it in your research or different programs? Um, there, okay, so there were only a couple articles that I read, and a lot of them actually came back from the Boston Medical Center. Um, so I, I mean, personally, I think it would be really, like it would be really beneficial for a place like Juno to have one, um, to have a bicycle program. I think it would be great, um, especially because there's a lot of people who like live downtown who bike all the way here uh, to come to work. And so I think that's pretty great and that they also get good exercise on that. Um, so, and I mean, yeah, like bikes are expensive. I have a friend who's like lost like three bikes and he builds all of them and they're like $1,000 each. But I mean, I think if we were able to have a program like this in Juno, I think it'd be really beneficial, beneficial, especially for those who don't have cars um, and stuff like that. So it's kind of what I have to say on that. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Probably didn't. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Jeffrey. I just want to mention there's a the state, we, there's an office called the Office of Public Advocacy. And among other things, they uh, have guardian ad litems who work for them. Mm -hmm. Some of those are lawyers and some of them are not. They work with guardian ad litems are assigned to families, to children who are minors, who are wards of the state. Then those guardian ad litems are always looking for cost of all kids, court appointed special advocates. And they train you and you take on, I've done this for years, you take on a family and you help them do whatever they need, whether it's a, maybe you get things for that, or you take them to school meetings, or you take them to the doctor, or whatever. You advocate for them doing things that a guardian ad litem can't do because they're just swamped. So court appointed special advocates through the office, what did I just say? <laughs> <laughs> that one. Yeah, that's actually cool. Yeah, I didn't know about that. Yeah. Does anybody have any other questions or comments that they would like to make? How many questions are on the ACE test? I think it's like 10. Yeah, it's not that many because that was it. This is interesting in Indian nurses. But, um, the original ACE study was actually done with middle class folks. So um, there is a common stereotype that ACEs reflect more lower income. Um, but those were the concerns, the things that had happened in those households that were part of the study by Kaiser Permanente. And then since then, there have been expanded ACE studies that include things that are also relevant, like historical trauma and other things that people report. So the original was pretty short, but I think there's a broader representation of um, people's adverse childhood experiences in subsequent studies. Yeah, has anybody here taken the ACE test? Oh, wow. What did you, like, when you guys saw your score, like, how did that make you feel, I guess? Or, like, what were you... So I feel like that's, I don't know, because I took it and I got like, I got an eight. But I mean, it's pretty, it was kind of shocking for me because I guess I just never took into account like what that could possibly like mean for me and my health. So I guess, um, I guess I just kind of wanted to like hear like, you guys don't have to tell me your score, but you guys can totally like explain like, well, when I got my score, this is how I felt kind of thing. So yeah, for those who took the ACEs test. What is the score? Um, I 
think it's just as many questions as like you answered yes to. So if you took the the 10 question ACES test and then you answer yes to as many questions, that's your score. So, yeah. So the higher your score, the more at risk you can be for some of the things that India has discussed that would be a great impact on your life. And not to talk about my score, my score's great, but just to mention the training, uh, as what Colleen talked about, really changed how I advise students. Mm -hmm. And to think about, you know, I might receive an early alert from a professor about a student who might be not doing well in classes. That just might be one symptom of other things that they're carrying, right? And so just try to remember that in my conversations and in how I might connect them with support. Mm -hmm. um, and just to let everyone know, usually on an annual basis, the Community of Juno offers a free ACES conference downtown. And so I went for free two years in a row. And um, yeah, so it's usually around June. And anyone can attend. Oh, uh, does so anybody have any other <laughs> questions or comments before we wrap up? Yeah, one of the uh, one of the sources that I, I'm looking at is the vocational area, especially starting in high school, of getting uh, young people into the community working and giving them credit for that, rather than penalizing them for having a job after school. Um, and actually helping people who are uh, transitioning from prison to the community uh, is another way that we struggle with uh, poverty because a lot of them, a lot of the individuals coming from prison are struggling because they're, they've been forced to be unemployed for long periods of time. And so in Norway, they have a model that transition is done while they're still incarcerated. And it really does kind of reduces the recidivism rate. And um, since we're not talking too much about the criminal justice system, by the way, which is different than the justice system. And it, it is more likely that they're going to have poverty uh, throughout their life or turn to crime to survive. So I'm hoping that you know we look more at uh, vocational training as well as. Uh, Promoting that in the schools are Hey, would like to say something. Oh, yeah. She's got a soft voice. <laughs> oh, I think there's like a. Press the button. Which. There's a green light. You might have to hold down for two seconds or something. There's a little power button. Um, there's, oh, at the bottom, I see a mute and a select. It's the mute button. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. <laughs> Thank you. Get out of here without saying a few words. I think, I think, and I think all of you should be thinking, and besides listening, hearing what the questions are, because that's what learning is about asking questions. But uh, all of you are, well, maybe some of you are asking good questions. And thinking. Juno is an exceptional little bird. And having traveled all of the continents, including Africa and Japan, where criminal justice is only 1% in the prison system. And we compare that to the United States, where they have huge prisons that have captive audience. And there's a captive audience in those prisons that could surpass 
um, the universal peace. Can't wait for all the universities to come in Boston Harvard, for instance, and Yale, and tomorrow in Chicago. I don't even know how I used to draw and define everything. That's a huge population where they graduate. Very intelligent people do not that know how to get out of jail and stay out of jail. I uh, appreciate my viewers. I think I could sit here and expand on a lot of those places because I have. And um, it just tickles me when some good questions come up. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you guys all for coming. Um, before you guys take off, please vote. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. You have a second before your next.